start off giving me just kind of a, a rundown of, of your story in, uh, in the fundamentalist group and, and what, how that, that journey took you. Well, my dad and my mom joined the fundamentalist group when I was about nine. And I um, pretty much don't really have memories before that. I, I do remember not going to the Mormon church when I was younger. I do remember um, mostly my life that I do remember is from the polygamous group, growing up in polygamy. And um, it was hard. My, you know, just watching the moms fight and quarrel and it was a lot of fear, scared me a lot. Um, the good thing about polygamy is all the little siblings that you get, and I love that part. Had, had a lot of fun with babies all the time. I enjoyed that part. But there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear growing up in polygamy. A lot of hiding. Mm -hmm. My parents were always really paranoid, you know, that people were going to find out what we believed, and we moved a lot all the time. So, you know, I, I, I developed a fear of the outside world, you know, just didn't want people to know about us. We, everything was quiet, secret, secretive, and we didn't talk about things to anyone, but just in our family. What kind of contact did you have with the outside world? Were None. You, None. You didn't go to school? Was no. There a no, I stopped going. The last grade I ever went to was fifth grade, and then, and then my parents pulled me home, and just a lot of paranoia in, with the outside world. So we didn't, ha we didn't go to movies, we didn't go to dinner, we didn't go shopping, except for behind the store to get food. So that was our shopping trip, that we did not go. I, I lived at home most of my life. And was this, was this kind of urban? Was it out in the country? Well, we How moved all the time, so yeah. we always were moving. Uh, you know, we, most of the time we, we lived in subdivisions, but we kept very much to ourselves. I know the neighbors were aware about us, you know, but, you know, we were really private kept a lot to ourself. Were all the wives under one roof? Most of the time. There were a few times we moved we, when we moved in a trailer that was too small for all of the, the wives and so they would kind of be at other places but most of the time we lived all together. And so was it a fear of what if you could put a peg the fear on something what would it be? I, I grew up with a lot of fear I, you know and I know just fear of the world, fear of Satan, fear of sin, fear of evil, you know, just always afraid of so many things. You know, my, my moms fought a lot, and so there was fear when they would fight. I would be afraid. I, I remember going and hiding. And sometimes there were really scary fights, you know. I just fear of having to live polygamy because of what I, you know, what I saw in, in my own family. But I had the kids and that always helped. <laughs> they were, they were just a joy, you know, just, they were my comfort. How many siblings did you have? There's 18 of us. 18? Mm -hmm. How many, uh... Nine many girls boys? and nine boys. Mm -hmm. Not pretty even. Yep. Um, and how many sister wives were there in your family? And most of the time there were three. My dad had um, those 18 kids with three of the women, but he was married to other women at, you know, that he had no children with. So you said nine years old is when you joined the... I think about group. nine. I, I couldn't even really as tell you how old I was for child. sure. Yeah. yeah, as a young child. So you were afraid of having to live polygamy, but what was your, what was your attitude regarding it as a doctrine? I mean, did you, were you a firm believer? Well, when you're, when you're taught all your life pretty much, about something, you believe it. You know, the Muslims believe that they're right. The Mormons believe that they're right. So yeah, I mean, I believed it because I was taught it, you know, my whole, you know, just pretty much it was something you had to do in order to be celestialized, to be able to ha have your family forever and to live in the celestial kingdom with God. And so yeah, when you're taught something and it's, you know, you watch it live daily, you believe that's, you know, my parents are smart people. They, they know what they're doing, and so I'm going to do what they're telling me to do. So, yeah, I did. I did, I did believe in the whole thing, everything. You just suck it up, and, yep. and even though it sucks, you just don't. Yep. Hmm. yep. Now, what, uh, what kind of idea then did you, what was your idea of who God was then growing up? 
Um, he was always a mystery to me. I, you know, once again, I, we didn't talk about Jesus. It was mostly God. And he, he just, you know, I, he was a mystery to me. I, I, I didn't know who he was. I knew he was someone big out there, but I didn't know. I, I certainly didn't have a personal relationship with him. And, I, and I, he wasn't somebody I counted on, for sure. So not, not somebody that I could trust. Interesting. So, so in, in contrast to your sister who had that connection as an early child, as a young child, you didn't I really never, I never found God as a child. I never, I never felt close to Him. I never um, felt like I could count on Him. I felt like, you know, once again, the most thing that I could count on was the kids in the family. I, they, that, they were my comfort. When a new baby was born, I, I was just like glued to that baby, you know, just the, that's where my happiness came from, through the, through the kids, the babies, and, and taking care of them. It, it gave me purpose, and it made me feel special, and it made me feel important, and it made me feel loved. And so that's where I found my happiness. And do you suspect that, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you think a lot of the mothers, that's how they view their own children as their only source of, of love and I don't know. I, I, couldn't answer. I couldn't answer how the moms felt or how, where they got their comfort from. I, I, I can't answer how, where they got their happiness from. I know they weren't happy. I know they were unhappy. There was a lot of unhappiness. So uh, walk me through the process then. What, how did you, what was your journey like to, to finding Christ? It's been a long journey. You know, I um, was in the polygamous group until I was 35. Had four children, married to my husband. And, you know, of course we believed that Joseph Smith was a true prophet. And, you know, he made a statement that made us, you know, convinced that, that um, polygamy or the Mormon church was where we needed to be and that, you know, we believed Wilford Woodruff when he said that we are not to live polygamy anymore. And so we're, you know, we easily walked away from the polygamous lifestyle and, you know, just embraced the Mormon church. So, was, you know, so there was never any polygamy in your particular nuclear no, family? Okay. No. Although I believed I was supposed to live it, you know, and, and I still believed, even as a Mormon, that one day it would be brought back because it was a true principle according to Mormonism. And so I, I believe that, you know, one day we would live it and that it would be a part of Mormonism. What did you think about that? Oh, I was scared. I didn't, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it when I was in the polygamous group. I was way relieved when we left and grateful, you know, that the Mormon church wasn't embracing it at the time. And, and so um, just really grateful. Just leaving the polygamous group was very freeing in the fact that I, I felt that burden lifted, but it was still on the shelf. I knew it was, the, it was back there, and I knew it was something I couldn't ignore. Finding the truth, you know, and finding it in the biblical Savior, I, I truly am free now. I mean, it, it is the most amazing thing, and he's amazing, and I found, I found him, and, and I love him with all my heart, and I'm free. I'm free from all the works that, that are required by man, but I have a personal relationship with my Savior who gave me a free gift that I can never earn, and his, his sacrifice on that cross was so perfect that it covers all my sins all my past, all my present, all my future, and that's how perfect he is. And he's amazing. And I love him. And how, how, did, you, uh, how did you encounter him? How did you come across him? <laughs> I, I read a book from the Mormon bookstore called Rough Stone Rolling. And when I read that book, I, I was devastated. Everything I believed in, I knew was a lie. And once I was done with that, I, I was lost for a little bit, you know, because I, I felt like, you know, I can't trust the Mormon God, you know, because he's not real. 
it's all a lie. It's just, it's fake. It's all just a made up story. And of course, Joseph Smith tells you, you can't trust the Bible. So I didn't know that I, you know, you're, you're you know, brainwashed into believing you can't trust the Bible. So I was lost. But thank God that my husband was traveling for work and had been listening to Bible studies and pointed me to the Bible. And so I started reading the Bible and, you know, through some other people that I met, you know, um, just through their um, example of uh, experience of reading the Bible, I was able to, you know, really just get into the Word of God and just see how, how amazing it is. And, you know, once you first start reading it, God doesn't open it all up to you at once. He, he gives you a little bit at a time just what you need, you know, at that time. But he illuminates his word. He opens it, up, opens it up and he takes the blinders away. And you know that it is, his, his handprint is all over the word of God. You know, it has been proven over and over through fulfilled prophecies and, you know, statistically impossible for the prophecies fulfilled in the Bible and, and they have been. I mean, it's just, it's amazing, it's a miracle, and it's God, it's God breathed. That's how amazing it is. So it says it was so. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so, was it, was, it was just simply your involved, your reading the Bible? Was mm -hmm. what, uh, yep, I just, you know, that's all I did. I just got into the Word of God, and, and it just became alive to me, and just, just so amazing and of course you know I I had that born again experience I I really did when I when I trusted what the New Testament said what Paul said what Jesus said I trusted um, I trusted it and you know when you do put your faith and trust in him he gives you the Holy Spirit to guide your heart and the Holy Spirit does bear witness of Jesus Christ, and it, it's just amazing. It's just truly amazing. How long ago was that? It was over a year ago. Yeah. So, yeah you're both still pretty fresh into it yeah. then. Yeah. And uh, so now, with the year's perspective, and uh, what, what would you say to somebody who's not yet ready to take that step? I would say it's the hardest thing I ever did, just leaving my kids in Mormonism and giving them up. Because as a Mormon mom, families are everything. They teach you that that's where your goal is, that's everything. And just having them not listen to me, you know, having them not believe me and their dad. and. You can't share the journey. You can't. It's something you have to go through on your own. And just giving up everything for Christ. It's hard, but it's so worth it. And I would not, I would not change it. I would not because eternal salvation is everything. Someone asked me just last week, they said, you know, if you loved somebody with all of your heart, and you knew you weren't going to be with them. Would, I mean, wouldn't you do anything to just be with them? You know, and I thought about my kids and I thought, you know, I love them so much. I mean, I, I raised them. I did everything for them. But what good is it if we're, we're, if we're all in hell? I, I, I don't care what I have to give up. I want to be with God. I don't want to be in hell. I want to be in heaven with my Savior. And so, yeah, I have to give them up. And I have to trust God. I, ha I have to lift them up to God and say, here, they're yours. You take care of them. Bring them to you because I can't do it. And I have to trust him. And I do trust him with all my heart because he doesn't lie. And for the first time in my life, I can trust what is said in his word. I can trust it. And I, and I, I read it every day. It gives me the strength I need to get through this something I didn't think I could ever go through. It's almost like a death to me, but I love them so much that I had to give them up so that I could have something that I don't deserve, but I'll take it. And, and I, and I want to live with God. 
That's how important it is to me. Did you have a testimony in, in Mormonism? Here, here's the problem with my testimony. I had a testimony of the fundamentalist group. Uh -huh. Then I had a testimony of Mormonism. And they were all based on feelings and emotions. And God tells us not to trust our feelings and emotions. For me, that answered a question for me. When I read that scripture, it answered a question. It was still really hard because you're taught to go by feelings. And so it was hard for me to get through it. But when God says, don't trust your feelings, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust Him or am I going to trust my feelings? And so, yeah, I had, I had um, spiritual experiences. But I had them in both places and they both can't be right. They just can't. And so I have to trust the Word of God and what He tells me, His guidelines, and so He's who I follow. But yet, at some level, you believed. Yeah, I believed um, in polygamy, for sure, deep in my heart. I knew it was true. Believed in the Mormon Church, deep in my heart. I knew it was true. But neither, neither one are. Now, you, you, you married in the fundamentalist group. Yeah. I actually married my, my dad's second wife's brother. So when I married him, he was my uncle. Through marriage, not through blood. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like a song that we Yeah, have. yep. Could so write a song. Children are your grandchildren. And your yeah, grandchildren. let's yeah, see. Like, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to draw that tree. Um, but uh, now was the expectation then while you were in the fundamentalist group, was the expectation that, that you would eventually live yeah. polygamy? Yeah, it was really hard. Really hard thinking about him doing that. It was something I thought about all the time and just really made my life miserable, for sure. So even though you, hadn't, you weren't living polygamy, mm -hmm. you were still you gotta do it. enslaved by yeah. the whole fear of... That polygamy. fear. I've lived my life in fear. Just fear of, oh, I've got to do that. And I'm free from that. I'm free from that fear. And it's amazing. Just amazing. Were, were you, as a couple, somehow, are, are you become second class citizens if you are monogamous? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they remind you all the time that it's time, that you need to, you need to take another wife. And it, it is, the pressure is great. You know, you, yeah, they, and, and they do lift those who have more than one wife. They lift, you know, they, their st status is greater than, than those who have one wife. So yeah, you, you are thought less of, you are looked down upon, and you are not as good as those who have taken that step and, and live, live, you're living, those that are living the fullness of the gospel, which is polygamy, according to Mormonism. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young. Yeah. So how and how long were you married and in the polygamy group? Let's see. Uh, I got married when I was 20, left when I was 35. So and then we were in the Mormon church for 14 years. So long time, long time living. Um, I had all my children. So yeah, long time living as monogamously without that sister wife. And, and I give that credit to my husband because he did not want another wife. He just, he just did not want to hurt me. He didn't want to break my heart. And he knew it would. And so, he's a great guy. Do some comparison between polygamy group and the Mormon church in, not just in terms of doctrine, but just in terms of what life was like and, um, how you perceived God and how you perceived reality and relationships with others in the group? You know, I felt like I felt more that there was, there was more God in the Mormon church than in the polygamous group because the focus in the polygamous group is having more wives. It's, on, it's about polygamy. And, you know, in the polygamous group, you're taught the Adam God doctrine. In the Mormon church, you're not taught that. Um, you know, there are definite, definite differences in doctrines, for sure. Racism is huge in the polygamous group. It's um, mellowed out greatly in the Mormon church. Yet all of the prophets taught, you know, Adam, I mean, well, Brigham Young, Adam God, um, 
And the Mormon Church's foundation is Brigham Young and Joseph Smith and what they taught, and yet they've they've kind of pushed aside those things that weren't po you know popular, weren't acceptable, like racism and the Adam God doctrine, polygamy. Um, yeah, I would say in polygamy the focus is in the polygamous group the focus is polygamy, and in the Mormon Church, um, works. Wow. Can I say that one more time? Works, lots of works. You know, the minute you are become a member, they want you in a. They want you to have a calling. They want you to feel included, and they want you to earn your way to heaven. It's a lot about works. You know, you've got to pay your tithing, you in order to get to the temple, so that you can be sealed, so that you can save yourself. You know, if your loved ones die, you save your loved ones. Jesus Christ is not in the equation. He's not. He's not needed you are saving yourself in the Mormon church. And, and there's not a lot of... Lately, they are really talking about Jesus Christ because they are trying to be Christian. But Jesus Christ was not the, fo you know, the focus. Mostly the works and what you do and your callings. And, and, you know, and I find it very interesting that people in the Mormon church, if you have... Let's say you're an elders quorum president. You are better. You are above those below you and so it makes you there's just a, the status you know you're, you even though you know these other people who don't have these callings as bishop or whatever you know you are under other men you are under what they tell you to do and what they say it, it's just you know it's just a man-made ah, ah I could go on forever but it really does put power of men over other men and it's evil it is wrong. Jesus Christ wants you to have a personal relationship with Him. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be the only one you worship and praise. And you can't do that in the Mormon church. You can't. Is it just a matter that they have pushed Him out? Or is it a matter that all the other stuff just kind of crowds? Oh yeah, you're definitely overwhelmed with the works. You know, the, the Jesus Christ of Mormonism is your brother and Satan's brother. So they're not even the same Christ, completely different Christ. Um, you save yourself. After all you can do, then the grace of Christ comes, through, comes in and, and takes care of whatever you can't do. You know, the miracle of forgiveness um, written by Spencer W. Campbell says that if you, you know, just reading through that book, if you sin and you repent, of that sin, if you do it again, all your sins have come back. It's impossible. It's an impossible gospel. You cannot be good enough. You cannot. God can't live with sinners. And yet we cannot be good enough. We will always be sinners because we live in a fallen world. So it's hopeless. It is hopeless and the depression is huge because Everyone knows they're sinning. Everyone knows that they can't be good enough. And I mean, when, when, do you decide, when do you decide after all you can do? I mean, how much is enough, you know, for that grace? And if you look up grace in the dictionary, you don't, you don't earn grace. Grace is a free gift that's given to you. And God's grace is so perfect that, you know, it covers it all. It really does. And, you know, when you're born again, the, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and it, it entices you constantly to do good, to do good works. Not because we have to, but because we want to please our God, because we love Him so much for what He's done for us. It's just amazing. We don't have a desire to sin, although we still do. But we don't have a desire. We want to, to please Him. And we, and we love him, and we don't want to disappoint him. Mormons are taught to believe that they have to do it themselves. They can't understand that when you're born again, you aren't doing it yourself. You can't do it yourself. God is there. His Spirit is there enticing you all the time. I mean, you really are free because you have so much support, so much help. 
in, in living better, doing better, and just that depression is gone. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how to, you know, I can't tell you. I'll wait. <laughs> When you were a Mormon and they were dumping these things like Adam God and polygamy and, and the other things that you had grown up with in the fundamentalist church, how did you reconcile that in your own thinking? Um, I mean, granted, you wanted to get away from polygamy, so that was kind of a nice You put thing. it on a shelf because you knew that the prophet Brigham Young, you know, he, he taught Adam God. So you knew he was a prophet, and if he wasn't a prophet, then you're in big trouble anyway. So you put it on a shelf, you know, anything, you, you would just put it on a shelf. You would just, okay, well, we'll think about that later. Well, the Lord will work it out, you know, that's just, the Lord will, he'll, he'll figure it out, you know, it, it, he's in control. And, and he is in control, but, you know, they have a false gospel. It is false. And as a born-again believer, you can't tell someone who's not born again how you feel. You can't, you can't explain to them what that process you've gone through. You can't explain to them what God has given you because they haven't felt it. They haven't been through it. And so they have to do it on their own. They, they have to have that faith and trust the Word of God and believe what Jesus says, believe what Paul says, believe the Word of God and, and trust Him. And, and, you know, I mean, I, it's not blind faith for sure. In the Mormon church, it's, it's blind faith. In the polygamous group, it's blind faith. Not, not, God has given us so much to go on. And He gives us the very faith that we have. You know, it's a gift. That's a gift. And so, you know, it, it's really hard to tell someone who, you know, it's easy for them to say, oh, you're a born again. Well, I, I am. And, and once you've experienced it, you'll know what I've, I, what I, what I've experienced. And it's amazing. Kind of like trying to describe color to somebody who's colorblind. Who's, yeah, you can't you can't describe color to someone who's colorblind. You can't do it. So, yeah. Great. When you became a a, a Christian, a, a born again Christian, what were some of the most difficult teachings, doctrines, beliefs, things that you had to get reprogrammed? The huge the huge thing that bothered me was families are forever, but. You know, when I was really, really struggling, just in the depths of struggle, I just had the strongest impression that it didn't matter because God's plan is better than anything Joseph Smith made up. And so how can we even question? You know, and then, of course, there's the feelings. I struggled with the feelings because, you know, that's a big thing. And, of course, I gave that to God, too. And then spirit, spiritual, you know, being having been with God before here, but it, it, it's just not biblical at all. Do we trust the Word of God or do we trust what Joseph Smith said? You know, and so those were the three things I had the hardest thing and after that it was just a breeze. <laughs> so. Compare and contrast who your idea of God and His attributes and His abilities when you were in the Mormon traditions, be they fundamentalist or, or Mormon, and and now as you as you know him, God as a Mormon God was not capable of much. We had to do a lot of the work. Same with the polygamy, we have to do all these things. You know, ever changing God can't be trusted because you don't know. Oh, well, we gotta live polygamy. Oh, nope, we're not gonna live polygamy now. Adam was God. Oh, now Adam's not God. You cannot trust the Mormon God because his prophets are just all over the place. None of them agree. They contradict the gospel. The Mormon gospel is contradictory all over the place. The Bible, however, the prophets in the Bible, no contradictions. Everything in the Bible, you know, all, all of the, the the prophecies have been fulfilled. Um, there are yet to be many fulfilled. I totally 100% trust that they will be fulfilled because my God now is amazing. He is capable of everything. He does not lie where my Mormon God lied. And the biblical God does not lie. 
He can be trusted completely, and I do. I trust him completely with everything. I just, I don't care what it is. I trust him completely, and I give it to him, even with my kids. And that's a hard thing because I'm, I'm OCD. I'm a con controlling person. I, I want what I want right now, and I want my kids to be saved right now. But I, I, I can't do it. But I know he can, and I trust him, and I give it to him completely. And trust him completely. I can't even explain to you how big he is to me because there's just no words. So amazing, so, so, so trusting. I, I just have, he has my complete trust. And I know he won't fail me. He's big, he's huge, he's amazing. What was your understanding then of his grace? Now, you you'd mentioned that there just, it just was not even part of the picture. In polygamy, there's no such thing as grace, really. I, I don't ever really remember ever learning about grace. I knew there was Jesus, and I knew he was my brother, and I knew he was Satan's brother, but I, I don't ever really even remember putting them together. Um, in Mormonism, grace is, you know, there for you after all you can do. And so that was grace in Mormonism. We got to do all this stuff. We got to do it. You know, that burden is so huge. You know, all the little sins that you know you have, and you know God can't live with imperfection, and it's hopeless. You know it's over. And so after all you can do, I mean, I've said this before, when is enough enough? When can you do enough? But the biblical Christ, the only one that can save, when he died on that cross 2,000 years ago for our sins, it was so perfect, it covers everything. And it, re and it really does. And, you know, the, the Mormon Jesus just, he didn't have it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't. And there's not anything that my Savior's shed blood can't cover. And, I, and here's another thing that I always really, especially now I think about, is Christ died in vain for Mormons. He did, because they don't need Him, really, because they have to do it all. So why, what's the purpose? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a really interesting question, because if we're saved after all we can do, no one does all they can do. No. We'll how, never be perfect. How did you live with that impossibility? How did you live with that, that, that hopelessness, I guess? I mean, it's, re it's really hard because you never know when you're good enough. You do, you do not know you're saved. You're never, you are, as a Mormon, you're not saved. Mormons are not saved right now. Well, we know they're not. But they can't believe they're saved. They, they, can't, they don't know when or if they'll be saved, you know, but as a biblical Christian, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved right now. That's how perfect Jesus is. That's how perfect he is. Because your assurance is not on yourself. It's on him, and he's everything. So, yeah, I'm saved, and I know it, and I know I'll be in his arms again. To me, that's just so amazing, so amazing. And what was, uh, what was your experience with the Bible beforehand? Yeah, I couldn't trust the Bible. Joseph Smith said that you could trust it as far as it was translated correctly. That's their eighth article of faith. You can't trust the Bible. And so I didn't read it. I read the Book of Mormon. You know, I mean, it was the... Even in, in the fundamentalist? Yes, I read the Book of Mormon. I'd start to read the Bible, but you know, you have blinders on. You cannot... Un I almost feel that God is protecting us until He has led us to where He wants us. He's protecting us because when you read it, it doesn't make sense. It's not the same gospel. It's a completely different gospel. And so when you read it with the blinders off, you're like, wow. I mean, it's just so amazing. I mean, so, I can't tell you how many times I've read the Bible, you know, in this last year as I've become born again and, and a believer in Christ. I can't tell you how many times I've read it and just been in awe. Just, you know, I'm just like get on my knees and thank God you are amazing. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. 
when I read, when I, I, I mean, it's my favorite book. Can't, I can't let a day go by without reading it. Awesome. Talk a little bit about the cost of, of the, what, 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 I mean, you, you've mentioned the, the cost of leaving your kids behind. To me, that's the only thing that cost me. Because I fiercely love my kids. They mean a lot to me. And so, you know, take everything. I could care, I could care about anything else. But that's the thing that hurts my heart the most. That's the thing. It breaks my heart every day. Nothing else matters. And to think that I taught them these lies that they firmly believe in, that I paid money to send them on, to cement on their missions. I just ask God to forgive me because that's the hardest thing for me. And that's the true cost. And once again, I just give it to Him. I give it to God. And I ask Him to forgive me for teaching them lies and to leading them astray from the true Word of God. I have one son that doesn't even believe in the Bible at all. And that really breaks my heart. Because it's the only place he's going to find eternal salvation. So yeah, the cost is my kids. And what, what's, do you have a relationship with, with the ones that are in Mormonism? Still? They've been really amazing kids. They still love me. And we just don't talk about the elephant in the room. I don't, I just love them. And I trust that God will bring them in his own time. You think they might watch you? No. Not for a long, long time. Never know. What, what would you say to someone who's questioning? What would you say to a woman if you was looking at her face to face? And how would you encourage her to take that step? I think if you're questioning polygamy and you are wondering if it's true, you know, just turn to the Bible. Compare the gospel of the Bible to the Mormon gospel. Because polygamy is, is it belongs in Mormonism. It, uh, Joseph Smith created polygamy. Compare it. Joseph Smith uh, created polygamy. The Lord never condoned polygamy in the Bible. Not once did he condone polygamy. These were these own, the people in the Bible who lived polygamy, it was their choice to do it. God never condoned it. He never required it, asked it to be done. It's just not biblical that he, he ever, ever wanted polygamy to be lived. He, he was opposed to it. Um, there's only one person that can save you, and he is God, and he became a man and died on a cross for you to save you. And he is found in the Bible. And if you trust him, he will save you. If you don't, you will be miserable. You will live in misery. If you leave and, and give yourself to Jesus Christ, he will give you the peace you need. He will give you the strength you need. He will give you everything you need to leave. And he will take care of you. He promises. And he, he doesn't lie. And he will not back down on his promises. Trust him. He's there for you. He's the only one that can save you. What would you say to somebody who may be an outsider who doesn't know anything about polygamy, Mormon fundamentalism? For those who have, have the ability to help people leave out, out of polygamy, you know, there, there can't be a greater reward to bring someone out of that and help them see their, them change their lives to be able to support them, whether financially, whether emotionally, you know, just help them find their way. 
these poor people have been born in this. They have been brainwashed from birth. You know, they are in, in such an unfortunate situation that they can't find themselves out of. Financially, there's just, they're destitute. I mean, there, there's just no money in, polygam in polygamous families. There's just, there's no way for them to leave without support from outsiders, those who are willing to help them, um, just support them, give them encouragement and just help them, whether it be a place to live, a place to take care of their families. And polygamists have large families. They have a lot of kids to feed, you know, and it, it's just such a hard, it, it's a huge step. Without help, you know, a lot of them will stay and they'll be lost. Not only lost on this earth, but lost forever. And that's a horrible place to be. In terms of your own personal marriage situation, or were there times when you would like to have been able to get out of? Um... I, I never ever felt like leaving my husband, right. but he was just married to me. Yeah. I can honestly tell you if he was married to someone else, I would have left. It, it, the burden is it's just so hard on your heart. I, I don't think I could have done it. I, I really don't think I could have done it. Knowing myself, knowing who I am, um, I would have left. And of course you know many, many people who are in that situation, who, who live in that misery. What, what difference do you think it would make if somehow they knew that there were a place that they could go where they would be safe, where they would have um, so a place for their children, where their needs would be met, that wouldn't involve polygamy? First of all, I think the biggest hill to climb is to believe that it's wrong. If it's wrong, why are they doing it? And if they know it's wrong, and they know it, it leads to no eternal salvation, eternal reward, then why are they living in that misery? Once they know that it's wrong, and that there's nothing to gain, I think if they had the support that they, they would leave. I really do believe that. You know, the heartbreak is too great. And, you know, I think whether it be financial, emotional, whatever, they'll need all of it. They'll need all of that support. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. But I'm also thinking of the cases, and, and maybe it wasn't quite as dire in, in, in your setting, but those who, regardless of how they feel about it, they may hate it, they may realize that it's wrong, yet they have no options. Yeah. I mean, they, if, yeah. you know, you think about the ones in Colorado City who they don't have any... The education. saddest thing with polygamists is they are so sheltered, they are afraid to reach out. They are afraid to look outside of their own little polygamous bubble or family. They're afraid to tell their own family members because they will be shunned. So they do keep it to them. They live in this burden alone. And, you know, I think if they knew that there was someone that would say, hey, come on, let's financially get you on your feet, let's get you, whether you go to college or whatever we can do to help you, yeah. If they, if they felt like they had that, but, but they, they do live in such a sheltered world that it's really hard for them to reach outside of that bubble. And so I think it takes a lot to get to them, for sure. And so if you could convince them that this is not going to buy you eternity, then you have them. Then mm -hmm. yep. they'd be out in droves. Oh, so. yeah. Why choose misery when you can have happiness? Yeah. No, they, they would leave. It's convincing them that what they've been told their whole life is a lie and that it's okay to leave and it's okay to not have to share your husband. That's the hard one because Mormon, in Mormonism and polygamy, fear is how they, they, they really control people through fear. They really do. You know, um, I felt fear when I was leaving the Mormon church because I had been taught, if you apostatize, it's over. Well, what does it matter if, it doesn't, if, if it's not true in the first place? Anything they say is not going to hold me to something that's a lie. It's not. They have no power over me. The only one that does is my God. And it's because I gave it to him and I took it away from them.
Is there any other things on your heart that you want to want to say that we haven't covered yet or um i just love being a christian and i have so many scriptures that i just love my favorite one probably is john 3:16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and god doesn't lie he doesn't lie, so you can trust Him. If He tells you you're going to have eternal life, you can trust Him. And that's who I put my trust in. So, yeah. <laughs>